This week on the ASP, I sit down with the incredibly talented Mona Marshall as we discuss her career, South Park, basically pretty much everything. Welcome everybody to the Animation Station Podcast, episode 101. My name is Josh, and today I am joined by a very special guest, the one and only Mona Marshall. How you doing, Mona? I am fantastic. Glad to be here. Oh, Woo! absolutely fantastic to have you on. Um, like I was telling you uh, previously, you're one of the voice uh, actors that I grew up listening to, and so just being able to talk to you like this is fantastic for me oh wow it's like when i met dawes butler Woo! <laughs> <laughs> so um now mona do you want to go ahead and just give everybody just like a quick little um like what you do for a living <laughs> i know it's a well, weird way to phrase that but <laughs> i'm an actor specializing in voice and some of the uh, animation projects you might know are south park i do about half the women in south park um, they finally gave us little kids to do, so I do red now. And uh, let's see. And then, of course, anime. Um, currently doing Blue Exorcist, Miwa on that, and known for Izzy on Digimon, and now Digimon Try. So, but I've done tons and tons of stuff. And, but I usually say it's IMDb. <laughs> but, uh, <laughs> uh, and then back in the day, I started out, I was three of the um, color kids on Rainbow Bright. So I, I have cells of those uh, in my office, and I will never forget a friend of mine who had raised a stepson came in and went, Oh my God! You did voices for Rainbow Bright? My son and I used to listen to those. <laughs> it was just a little thing. Anyway, that was fun. So, anyway, I, when I started doing voiceover, you did everything. So, background for all kinds of pictures, a lot of Disney stuff and Pixar, which is also a lot of fun because it's all impro improvisation, and mm -hmm. depending on what the film is, uh, you know, we get to do different voices. Sometimes they want us to just use regular voices. Sometimes we get to do something wild and wacky. So when I'm in the voice of Doraemon, uh, the English-speaking mm -hmm. voice of Doraemon, and for Chavo, the Spanish... Uh, series that's known throughout um, Spanish-speaking countries. And that was quite an honor because there's a, a, well, both of them are quite an honor because when you're taking over something that's been established in another country, I mean, that's a lot of responsibility. <laughs> Fortunately, I have great directors. So anyway, so that's a little bit about me. Um, what else would you like to know? Um, now, did you start off uh, knowing that you wanted to be a voice actor? Or... Oh, no, I did not. Um, my degree is in English, and then I came out here and worked on a master's in theater. Mm -hmm. And I had not a clue what voiceover was. And I, you know, I have to be very honest, I was a bit of a snob because oh, commercials, I don't want to do that. And anime, I mean, it didn't even occur to me. There were voices for, for cartoons. I mean, I knew there were, but, you know, I was a little bit full of myself. I wanted to be a serious actor. And I was teaching fifth grade because I couldn't earn a living doing a serious <laughs> actor. I never quite fit in a groove, you know. And so one of my fifth graders was studying with Dawes Butler. He had this incredible workshop back then. Mm -hmm. And um, so she kept after me. And she knew I could sing, too. She kept saying, oh, you've got to take this class. So to shut her up, I took the workshop. And back then, I mean, it was incredible. Um, and sorry, everybody, real, real quick, Dawes Butler, was that... Yogi? Yogi Mugra? Bear, Quick Draw McGraw. When Hanna-Barbera started, he was most of the voices. Okay. Just like, yeah. So, I mean, I, I didn't know he was, but here's the irony. When I was growing up, one of the cartoons I watched was Rough and Ready. I had not a clue until years later that he was one of those voices, and he was the voice of, of Ready. And they were uh, dog and cat, and they were really funny and cute. But that was one of those things on Saturday morning I watched. So here I am studying with this man, and because of him, and this has a lot to do with anime and sync, because of him and because of something he wrote for me, the city of Los Angeles decided they were going to have a, a bil bilingual multicultural shows, uh, touring shows throughout uh, the county and the city, 
that would be paid for under the TAPLA program, which was a government program, um, so that we could go in and perform in schools and at rec, rec centers free. He had to audition for that, and Dawes wrote me a wonderful monologue about um, an ad agency executive. And I had, I'm a songwriter, and I had written a song called Joey, and I auditioned with those two things. And what was really special about that is I ended up being in a company called um, the L.A. Moving Van and Puppet Company. Now, I had never worked a puppet, a hand puppet, or any kind of puppet in my life. So um, so I got the job, and I'm thinking, what? First of all, I never thought about um, performing for children. And this is what we were doing. We were going throughout the, the city doing performing for kids. Um, I did not speak Spanish, so I learned Spanish, a little bit of Spanish by rote. And I knew nothing about hand puppets. But the director, Paul Hansen, was a very smart man. And this is when the Muppets were really, really big, just you know, coming into their own. He decided it would be a lot easier to cast and use actors and teach them how to work a puppet rather than to take puppeteers who had no acting background and try and teach them how to act. So I remember spending hours in front of the mirror working my hand, okay, and then, you know, eventually putting a puppet on it. And what's so neat about that is years later when I got my first anime job, which was for Harlock, I I didn't even know what I was doing. I just got up and looked at the time code and looked at the words and suddenly, boom, I was matching sync. And that, I now realize, I realized many years later, was because of all those years, the 10 years I spent touring, doing puppets. And now, of course, I love performing for children. That's part of what I do um, at Desconso Gardens, and now I'm doing it at Base Camp uh, High Horse Dinette. Um, And we're about to turn, um, to go from my blog to a vlog entitled Mind Magic for Kids, K-I-D-Z. So all... To me, it's just amazing because my career just didn't turn out the way I planned, but turned (laughs) out so much better because what I learned in Dawes' class is I could be any age, I could be any sex, because if you think about it, about half the voices I do are are little boys, and it, it just opened me up to everything. And if I had continued with that thing of, oh, I want to be a serious actor, and I'm just, not that there's anything wrong with that, it's great. But I realized that maybe by shutting off the little voice in my mind that told me what I should do and looking at what is and what was coming to me, I was much better off. So that's how I got started in voiceover, <laughs> kicking and screaming. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, so you do a lot. So, well, uh, I'm just going to just going to st- take a step back. So you're a singer, songwriter, voice actor, mm-hmm. um, teacher, drama, theater, you are pretty much, you are a renaissance person, like, by um, far. I, you know, all I know, honey, is these are the gifts that God was given, okay? And I also write, and I'm also an artist. If you mm-hmm. go to the website, monamarshall.net, um, I'm actually wearing them, not that you can see them, but I have little wire sculptures that came out of a um, just the idea of, of wanting to take the essence of beings and putting them into some kind of motion. First I did it as a pen and ink, and they were little wire dancers um, because they look like wire, and then I actually now have rendered them into wire so that they're pendants, you can hang them, you can wear these earrings, and they're on my website. And for years, um, and I've sold many, many of these. Also, I've been commissioned to do larger ones, but I sold them under my artist's name, 30 years, Malki, which is a derivation of my name in Hebrew. But when we started to consolidate everything, I now sign everything um, Malki slash Mona. So anyway, yeah, I, any, I, those are the gifts. So either I use them or I, they go away. So <laughs> I'm just fortunate that I can use them all. So you've been in the industry for a long time. What has that been like, just the evolution of uh, of the voice? We'll just go the voiceover industry. Because like, you started with, um, you know, doing these classes, not really knowing, you know, a whole bunch about it, to where now you are on probably one of the most popular animated shows 
on his yeah. in history. So what what was that transition like from going from being a teacher, being a uh, theater buff, to going and doing all of this, and you know basically how everything has evolved over the years? I know that's a well, big loaded question. Well, there's there's a couple of things. I think one of the biggest changes that's made everyone's life easier, except if you're the engineer fighting it, is Pro Tools. You know, when I started out, they were still using, you know, razor blades and reel-to-reels. And mm -hmm. um, we had just made, they just made, <laughs> after I got my voice demo made, they then transitioned into cassettes, right, for demos, mm -hmm. and then into CDs, and now, you know, you just upload it off of your computer. Um, one of the major changes I see is that everything has now become compartmentalized. When I started out, voiceover was everything. And fortunately for me, I still do that. I still do the um, tag announces for Publix grocery stores. They've been a, a wonderful, um, wonderful to me because I've been doing that almost as long as, well, not quite as long as I've been doing South Park. Um, I do background stuff for films, and I love that because it uses all my improv improv skills. Um, anime. It used to be the time that if you did anime, you did anime. Or in the beginning, you, anime people did not do um, uh, original animation. Well, when I started out, it just so happened that I did both because I was getting cast by people who did anime and people who did original animation. And a lot of people, I think, who started in original animation have difficulty they're not used to dubbing. You know, that's a real skill, to be able to match sync and still maintain meaning. So I love it. And then when South Park came, <laughs> when South Park came along, <laughs> that is its own thing because there's nothing I do voiceover that is like South Park. Nothing. And um, every skill I have as an actor and as a voiceover person has come into play because. Um, First of all, we don't get a whole script. I just did uh, some original animation yesterday. Can't name the project because I'm not allowed to. Yeah, yeah. But it was a wonderful character. Now, I had a script, but I had the script ahead of time. So at least I could figure out, okay, this is what's happening and I can see. You know, in anime, you see the picture, right? Yeah. So that's helpful. So with South Park, South Park is the only animation company wherein the week that it's going to be released on air, everything is done in that week. All the writing, all the sync, all the backgrounds, all the drawing, it's all done in-house in that week. So the air date is Wednesday, the night before Tuesday. We might be in there recording at 12 or 1 o'clock in the morning. Man. And the night of the last election ending to that show was a little different. So we were sent home at 12 o'clock and, and had to get back by 8 because the ending had to be rewritten. So, and the other part of that is I do Kyle's mom who has a New York Jewish accent. Mm -hmm. Right? I thought, what? Oh, I had no idea. Chicken pox was such a dangerous illness. Well, a lot of times what happens is during the week as the lines are coming up, um, Trey and Matt are, will go in and they'll do like a dummy track. The good thing is that they, their chops are really great, so they're right there, and if they know what's going on, it's because they've read the script. When I come in on a Tuesday night, say, or during the weekend, mostly on a Tuesday night, um, I don't have a clue. I have a, no clue about what's going on, so I get filled in a little bit about what's happening in the scene. I'm listening Trey, and then I have to kind of work backwards in that I have to figure out what's really going on with that character. And because Trey uh, does not do a Jewish accent, um, <laughs> I then have to make up for the fact that in the timing there has to be a Jewish accent, and he speaks fast. I mean, he's remarkably good, and I've gotten so much out of listening to his reads. But, oh, my gosh, I call this voiceover without a net because you have to be so present. Sometimes you're matching sync, but sometimes there's still, you know, just animatics. And so there's no sync, but you have to know what's going on, and the timing is precise. So within that very tiny frame, right, the timing, I have to make sure that character comes to life, 
realistically works within a scene where I have no idea, except for the words on the paper, what is being done. Man. So it takes a lot of concentration and a lot of focus. It's also great fun. It's very challenging, and I love it. But, oh, my gosh. It's, <laughs> it's not for the faint of heart. You have to think on your feet. You really do. And, you know... I, I stepped into the shoes of somebody who was an enormously terrific actress, mm -hmm. Mary Kay Bergman, and um, you know that was those first few years were very hard. She was a sweetheart and a great loss to the industry. So, did I did I answer any any of those questions? Oh, no, no, that me? was that was a really good that was a really good question because yeah, that was going to be one of my next ones was I was going to ask about South Park because I knew that their stuff was so. They keep they keep up so much with current events that I knew that their episodes were basically week to week. It wasn't anything mm -hmm. where we have the whole entire season yeah. mapped out like most play like like most animation projects. So mm -hmm. I was going to ask about that, but you answered that perfectly. But I did want to get back to Pro Tools and why mm -hmm. that was so important. Pro Tools is an editing tool for um for audio, and before Pro Tools. You could give a great read, and if it did not match exactly, and you have to understand that even when you get finished anime, say in Japanese, it's and it's and it match. Sometimes that doesn't even match. So now you're working with Japanese that doesn't really match the sync, and then having to match the sync in English. Pro Tools, because of the the nature of being able to squeeze things a little shorter or be able to to um, stretch things. It's allowed the actor and the director to be able to create performances that are really good without, you still have to match sync. Obviously, your sync has to be good, mm -hmm. but not so much to the point that, oh, wow, that's a good read, and it's just a little bit too short. They can fix that. And that, uh, I, I joke, um, <laughs> in fact, I said this at the session yesterday, a good engineer, good director, good line producer, you know, good director of animation. It takes everybody. You know, Mrs. Clinton said it correctly. It takes a village to raise a child. It takes a little audio village to produce anything <laughs> that's worthwhile. So it, there's just the best times I've had in voiceover are when everybody is really, you know, working for the project. What's going to make the project the best as opposed to, you know, when egos get involved. And I've been very fortunate in that that has some... Um, that's really not happened much in voiceover in my voiceover career. Excellent. So now uh, this is going to be kind of a another little kind of like tangent question. Is there any sort of property or anything that you would like to do? And it can it can be animated. It doesn't have to be animated. But is there something that you really want to perform in? Yes, my own show. <laughs> um, I started. I know, I, I started creating a, a project called Adventures of Puss and Dick, a Survivor's Guide to Relationships. And back in the day before we had an iPad and, and we used that for the scripts, we would have paper scripts and I would draw on those scripts. And um, uh, <laughs> I had created a, a gift many years ago called How to Prepare Your Love. And I created that because I was watching people around on me in relationships um, that as they got married and had children and were working on their careers, they began to spend less and less time focused on each other. If if you don't have those moments, you can't expect, well, let's go away for a weekend and we'll catch up. <laughs> um, so I, I started noodling around with the concept, and, and this has a lot to do with um, the idea of yin-yang, of balance with men and women. And some of the erotic drawings that I do, uh, especially the pen and ink ones, had to do with um, beautiful, <laughs> beautifully shaped penises with women within them. And so I've done those, I've sold those throughout the years. And then I began to think in terms of, based on my own marriage too, what makes a relationship work? And part of that has to be having some kind of understanding of the other person, stepping in their shoes. And men and women think very differently. Or I should say males and females, because you can have a same-sex relationship, mm -hmm. and one is going to be more of the feminine aspect and one's going to be more of the male aspect. So I began toying with the idea of creating a very cute vagina. Uh, I mean, Betty Boop was in the Mac 
back of my mind and a handsome, strong uh, penis. And I began, you know, as animated characters. And uh, little by little, uh, I, I actually did an animated um, short of six minutes with Chris Neosi, a wonderful voice actor who actually does the voice of Dick um, for uh, this project. And mm -hmm. anyway, the idea being that they would switch, okay? When they got into a heated argument, they would switch. And how they switched was they had intuitive thought in the form of Venmar the angel. And Venmar is androgynous, Ven, Mar, Venus, Mars. And mm -hmm. he has a sidekick name, a uh, sidekick bird, uh, who doesn't realize he's dead, <laughs> named Fido. And Fido sort of acts as the Greek chorus and the go-between. And Anyway, uh, so I did this animated version, and I was excited about it, but you know, in this industry, unless you are in the executive part of a network, uh, some kind of a network, yeah, I have no clout. So someone in development suggested I do it as um, as um, uh, uh, a comic, and I was fortunate. Uh, and they also said you really need to get a media consultant. So I found um, Yasmin, who's been fantastic because I did not grow up with computers and the social media. <laughs> And she's been wonderful in getting me out there and getting the project out there. And then Chris Neosi, who did my original animation, uh, was not particularly interested in doing this as a web comic. Um, I happened to talk to my neighbor, whose girlfriend is an illustrator, Ani Karaglanyan, and she uh, did a wonderful job. Um, we made the characters a little more sensual than the first animation, so mm -hmm. we and did, um, I think, six storylines over a period of, of over a year. And realized that, yes, people are watching them, but people don't really want to read. So now what we're doing, and we're going to release this the last Wednesday of this month, is I have read them, and then I've added sound effects. I found a wonderful guy named um, Josh uh, Schwartz. I'm sorry. Mm -hmm. Zach, <laughs> it's nice if I get his name right, <laughs> Zach. I'm so sorry, Zach. Um, and he's been terrific. And then Ani is in the process of doing some limited animation. And we're hoping that that will set us up as a demo to go into a Netflix or um, a Hulu and sell it. So, um, because that's my goal. I want it sold as um, animation. And I think, I mean, the idea is, is <laughs> so needed. The idea of being able to communicate um, without vitriol and to really stay open to intuitive thought, I think, is something that's really needed right now. Plus, it's funny. I mean, come on. It's a penis and a vagina, an androgynous angel, and a bird. Come on. So, uh, anyway, I'm excited about that, and I've done a Bible for it. Um, so, I have uh, about 18 episode mm -hmm. ideas, and uh, I think the timing is now. So I've got my fingers crossed, and in the meantime, um, uh, Zach, I found out, can uh, may be able to do some voices for that as well. So we've basically got, oh, and the idea behind Puss and Dick is they're every man and every woman. So basically you've got two characters that can change ethnicity, they can change ages, because whatever problem comes up, it's still basically female aspect, male aspect, and the idea of when you're willing or sometimes you're slammed against the wall to become willing, you begin to understand each other. No one's saying, oh, men should think only like women. Women should think like men. It's just the idea that if you can step into somebody else's shoes, even if you don't agree with them, even if you don't agree with them, you have a better understanding. And isn't that what communication is supposed to be about? Mm -hmm. Now, um, you said that you did, like, you had kind of done a little bit of, like, the webcomic stuff. Do you have any of those out available? Oh, my God. It's on our website. Sure. Oh, really? Oh, um, sweet. If, if you go to adventuresofpussanddick.com, you will see it. So Puss N, an N. So it's Puss N Dick. Um, so, yeah. and, we'll, and we'll put that in the show notes. So um, I know I'm going to definitely go, you know, read those because that sounds amazing. So if you guys want to listen, okay. I mean, if you guys want to read it as well, they'll be in the show notes along with all of Mona's stuff. So that way you can find her and everything on social media. And if it, there's anyone in this area, the fabulous Yasmin has came to me, one, 
came to me one day, sorry, I actually use his mouth to actually earn my living. Um, she came to me one day, um, oh gosh, about eight months, after eight months of knowing her and getting stuff started, and she said, Mona, do you know anybody who's a life coach or a family and marriage counselor? And I said, as a matter of fact, my best friend is a family and marriage counselor, and she's really good. She said, I think you should do a workshop about communication. So, we are about to do our third one on the 19th, right here in Glendale, and that's been kind of neat because, for my part, I'm using some theater exercises about focus, and also I've added how to open up your senses. And then Marsha is actually showing some wonderful tools, and when a situation could be a little angry, how to diffuse that and take care of yourself without creating another problem with the other person. So I love the idea that it's all kind of related to Adventures of Puss and Dick. <laughs> you know, uh, good tools in today's climate. Anyway, what else would you like to know? So, so you've got your voice acting. You've got um, Puss and Dick, or the Adventures of Puss and Dick. You've got um, your workshop that you're doing. Is there anything, I mean, in your, your business, um, uh, you've got the reading to kids. Is there anything else that you're that you're doing right now? Um, I mean, besides earning my living as a voiceover. Besides actor? earning your living, yeah. Like any any other projects um, that you're working on that, that you're allowed to talk um, about, yeah. I don't I don't want to get you in trouble or anything. Oh, oh, outside most of the well, I just did um, uh, <laughs> uh, Hotel Transylvania three, and I, I don't. Did you get my email? Oh, good. <laughs> on a yacht wrap party. I'm really excited about that. <laughs> the only other yacht party I've ever been to was my first year on South Park. And that was so much fun. That was when South Park was still not that known. And that was a fun party. It was a lot of fun. Anyway, so um, I can talk about that. But um, most of the stuff I'm doing, you know, they don't let you talk about it until it's almost out there and they've announced it. Yeah, so I, I, I kind of, I kind of didn't, ex, uh, didn't phrase that very well. I meant like, what, what are you doing personally? Now, it doesn't have to be about um, you know, oh. your acting or anything like that. Well, yeah. Okay. Oh, okay. This is something that's really close to my heart, and once again, uh, I can't say enough about Yasmin, uh, because my, once again, you know, I am, I am known somewhat in in a certain part of this industry, but I am not, you know, a big mover and shaker, and I have been doing a blog for over a year. And they're just about my observations. Um, sometimes uh, the blog has come through. Uh, my dog, Emma Sue, uh, has written it for me. Uh, I, my brain once wrote one, and I think my uh, computer keyboard once wrote one of those blogs. But um, one of the things that I really love, as you know, uh, based on what we've just said, is I love uh, interacting with children and reading to children. Mm -hmm. And for a long time at one of the local schools in Burbank, I developed a program called Mind Magic. And, you know, once a week I also do voices for fun. All of this can be accessed, by the way, through monamarshall.net. Um, and in it, my what I wanted to do there was I do two minutes, show people how to use their voice, whether they're in voiceover, whether they just want to speak better, whether you want to talk to your children better. Um, it's all about voice production, and that's what I, I do and, and do well, and that comes from years of work, but also from a very good foundation at um, LACC many, many years ago. But when I developed this program, Mind Magic, it was meant to be about helping children attach imagery to what they read. Mm -hmm. So I wrote a 10-part um, uh, read-aloud radio play, Program and in it, there's all kinds of fun things like their um, tongue twisters because it helps with articulation. And there are also drawings, that, linear drawings, and uh, there's some songs, all good for kids. So Yasmin said to me, you know, why don't you start doing that as a blog? And we can cut it down to maybe three or four minutes, and you can start doing once a week. So we're just in the process of doing that. Um, I would still be doing that once a week at McKinley Elementary School, mm -hmm. but my fourth grade teacher, who I used to do it for her uh, class, um, she went on to middle school. So uh -huh. that's real close to me. I, I think part of that is teaching children mindfulness. 
I used to have kids at the beginning. These were third and fourth graders. At the, the beginning of that class, close their eyes, and I would help them with the visualization. It was, you know, I would take them all the way through using all their senses, and then there was a really funny twist at the end, which I will not share because I'll probably be doing that <laughs> online. So, but once again, if we can reach kids and we can be, get them to become more mindful, just ran into another gal uh, who teaches in Santa Cruz. She's teaching mindfulness to kindergartners and using her art. Uh, and remarkably, she's hearing back from um, parents of kids she's taught two or three years ago. So these are now third graders. And they're coming home saying things like, you know, I had kind of a rough day. I think I'm going to go in my room and meditate. Now, if you, and she wants to teach this to teachers. I mean, she's really remarkable. And we're hoping that maybe down the line, she and I can do something together. Um, but it makes me realize that, um, and all of this is connected with communication. It's all about communication with care. If you can reach kids at an earlier enough, early enough age and help them to think things through, help them to visualize, help them not to be so stuck in the phone, in the computer, on the iPad, but to also reach out to what's going on around them and to really, when they're upset and angry, find positive ways to deal with that and diffuse it, we might be able to counter some of the violence and hostility that is going on in the world. So for me, doing Mind Magic for Kids and doing um, Communication with Care Workshop, both of those are my answer to a problem that I think is growing in a positive, constructive, creative way. Mm -hmm. So basically, that's that's it. That, that <laughs> that's what amazing. I'm doing. I, I wish I would have had you know something like that when when I was growing up because my my thing was like get home from school, be kind of angry, be like I'm gonna go break some eggs, and that's pretty much how that went. So yeah, so that 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 sounds that sounds amazing. In, think about that that angry energy turned into something constructive like with art or with writing or with building. One of the things we used to do as kids um, is when any, whenever anybody had a refrigerator delivered, you know, those were big boxes. We would make things out of those boxes. When I toured with the L.A. Movie Band Puppet Company, that was one of our little shows that we did. We had different size boxes and we would create different things, a rocket ship, a fort, um, you know, a uh, Riding Academy, where you know we could ride horses, mm -hmm. and one of the boxes would become the horse. So, I don't want to see that disappear. We need it. I mean, if you think about how much time and energy and thought is put into games, for instance, mm -hmm. that's all that kind of imagination. I will, I will never forget. Years ago, I did a um, I was doing a game tell. And I was talking to the young man who had created the game. And he opened up to me about having um, a short attention span. What is it, OC, OCD? ADHD. A ADHD. And um, what helped him was creating games, because you're doing them in segments, right? Like three choices. Here's this segment choice. Here's this segment choice. So he took what could have been thought of as a defect and turned it into an asset that later became, became the way he earned his living. And not only did he earn his living, but he did it in a really helpful way to other people. So I just think any time we can take that kind of human energy and use it in a creative way, oh my gosh, that's world changing. I have a picture, um, you can see it on the, on the website, that I created one day when I was writing a blog. And it's different colored hands, and they are touching each other, forming a heart. And it's called The Power of Together. And, you know, it came to me. I'm very fortunate. I have a lot of gifts, but I also know those gifts pass through me. They are mine to be of service to other people, as well as, honestly, enjoy myself. But, mm -hmm. you know, what's the point if I'm not sharing them? Yeah. And I realize that is so true. We see how mass hysteria can be very negative, but if you took that power, you know, like the idea of mindfulness, and, and you spread that, that 
is enormously powerful. It's greatly, it's a great counter to the negativity that's out in the world. It's really easy for people to feel disenfranchised, to feel like I can't, what's the use? But turning that around to, yes, I can. Um, and um, uh, it's not about, I can't stay up late, but I choose not to stay up late because tomorrow I've got day at school. Um, I choose not to play this game all night because I need the rest and maybe that'll make me play better the next day. <laughs> Do you see what I'm saying? Yeah. Uh, the can'ts, the shoulds, the must nots. There, if you can show a child that by having a thing, okay, we're going to put this away now because, and there's a good reason there is. They need their rest. We all need our rest. You know, maybe don't drink so much because if you do, it's going to dissipate. Your body's going to feel crappy. So, and then you go on the next day and you've got another fighting chance to do something else. Doesn't mean you can't drink. Doesn't mean you can't stay up late. Doesn't mean you can't play games. It's just getting back to the idea of balance. So anyway, that's what I'm up to. I have to tell you, I, I love Unlocked. I, I. You know, for years I did not do any kind of social media mm -hmm. because I thought, well, you know, I'm really fortunate and I'm, I'm lucky to be able to do what I do for a living. And it didn't really occur to me. There's this whole world of people out there that you can reach out to and that they're interested and you can impart things that were given to you that have helped you that can help them. So... Uh, I just got a, a really sweet little um, montage of some of the characters I did from a, a young lady named Caitlin. And it's not the first one of these letters I've gotten where, you know, anime has meant so much to this young lady. Mm -hmm. And it's her way of showing, look, see what I can do, see, see what inspired me. And i got to tell you, <laughs> it's a pretty wonderful thing. Pretty wonderful to see. That's my phone, which I'm not answering because I never do. <laughs> um, but uh, it's it's pretty amazing to see the fans out there, and I just didn't really have any kind of way to reach out and touch them. And Unlocked has given me that, so I'm I'm enormously grateful for that. And to Bryce, oh you know, yeah, um, who I just I mean he's wonderful. <laughs> he's, I mean <laughs> I think about well his mom is a sweetheart too, and what she's done with the fairies and. I love, but um, I remember Bryce's dad, you know, and if you believe in this sort of thing, I think somewhere um, Cappy's got a big old smile on his face going, that's my boy! <laughs> so It's pretty amazing. That's one of the things, you see, about being around long enough, you get to see people grow up, and then you get inspired by them just as uh, hopefully they've been inspired by you. Yeah, because I, I remember uh, Bryce and I talking about it because, um, like, he came on the show and then we were talking about Unlocked afterward and uh, we were just kind of bouncing off ideas. And I was like, this sounds amazing because usually the only other time, um, like, especially growing up, I mean, like, conventions weren't that big of a thing anime-wise. I mean, there mm -hmm. were, like, Star Trek and Comic-Cons and those type of conventions because those, those were more mainstream. But, like, the anime stuff wasn't really anything... You know, it wasn't big, but right. now now that we've got unlocked and you can talk with people from all yeah. over the place, and that's I I think like I think it's fantastic. I I absolutely love unlocked. Um, I love what they're doing over there, and it helps me you know, you know, get to hear from some of my favorite actors and and actresses because like I didn't know that you were on unlocked until like I just happened to be like scre uh, streaming down some stuff and I was like, oh snap, that's Mona Marshall. I've heard her in all kinds of stuff. I'm gonna sit there and listen. So I was listening to stuff, and it's a, it's a great way to you know you know reach out with people, and even people that haven't been in you know like it's not just for anime people. Like John Barrowman's right. on there, um, Dante Bosco's on there, all kinds of people are on there that aren't just anime related, and right. it's really re it's a really cool thing to do. Yep, yep, yep. I think it's a brilliant idea, and I am so glad that he thought of it. Um, oh yeah, it's pretty fantastic. It's. Ah! It is exciting. I, I have to say this one thing, um, uh, well, two things. Kevin Seymour, um, who is a director who passed a, a couple of years ago, he 
really did a lot for helping uh, anime become mainstream. Mm -hmm. And about the time that I was working on some project with him, I was also asked to do Spirited Away, Miyazaki's incredible film. And it was two days' work uh, over at Disney. And it was amazing because the group of us was kind of divided into two. Those of us that did anime and, and were very familiar with it, good actors, and then the other set, all, all good actors, but, you know, they didn't really know what anime was, and it was kind of like, really, this that silly stuff from Japan? By the time we got halfway through the day, those people were like, oh, my God, this is amazing. <laughs> so it was so gratifying to see that. And I kind of wish, you know, Kevin Seymour, um, uh, who loved anime before people knew what anime was here, um, I, I, he would have been great on Unlocked. He just would have been fantastic. Um, and wherever he is, I'm sure he's smiling down going, wow, all right. It's about time these people understood what this was. Pretty cool. Pretty cool. So, Anything else you'd like to know, sir? Um, well, do you have any good uh, any advice for anyone? Like, uh, we'll just kind of you know, broaden it. Like, any aspiring voice actors, aspiring artists, writers, anybody like that? Uh, a couple of things. Make sure you develop your inner life and that you form relationships that are real um, because that helps us. You know, it helps me as an actor. If I only have my own experience and I stay locked up in my own little room doing my own little things, I don't have a chance to interact and see what's out there. That's one thing. And the second thing is, if you truly love this, if you truly love what you're doing, don't give up. Just keep on. I was not. It took me a while to get any kind of establishment in voiceover. Um, everybody else in Dawes' class seemed, now is touring. I was doing work with the L.A. Moving Band and Public Company. But everybody else um, in Dawes' class seemed to be working before I was. And then finally, little by little, more and more and more. And then, because in the beginning, you're counting your jobs. Oh, I did that one. I did that one. And then suddenly, you know, you've done so much work, you can't keep track of it. So do that. And also, it's a discipline. You know, um, one of the reasons I... I Started voices for fun is, you know, I emphasize breath control, placement, diction, and mind magic. Making the images on the page or even the ones you're looking at come to life with your imagination. So, you know, it's a skill as well as an art. Work at it. Same thing if you're an artist and you believe in what you're doing, do it. Do it. Do it for the love, not for the money. Do it for the money, you will, in my opinion, never, ever be happy. But if you do something because you love it and because it's meaningful to you, chances are it's going to be meaningful to somebody else. You'll never, ever, ever give up. Winston Churchill. I think that's about it for me. Yeah, that's, that's, gr that's great advice. Let me... Yeah. Okay, yeah, I think... Uh, I mean, that's all the questions really I have. Um, now, Mona, where can everybody find, and again, we're going to put all of these links in the show notes, but where can everybody find you, social media, website-wise, all that? Okay. Uh, first of all, monamarshall.net, and then I'm going to uh, let my fabulous social media person tell you that information. <laughs> Instagram, she's on Mona Marshall Voices, so at Mona Marshall Voices. And for the Adventures of Puss and Dick, it's Adventures of P as in uh, Puss, N as in Nancy, and D as in Dick. So P and D, Adventures of P and D. And you can remind them, the more support I have, the more chance I have of getting Adventures of Puss and Dick on as an animated series. Yes! Exactly. We all and need a little Puss and Dick. Hmm? <laughs> eh? We all, we all need a little puss and dick in our lives, let's face it. <laughs> I want a shirt that says we all need a... That should be your first shirt, is we all need a little puss oh and dick God, in our lives. Oh my God, I have shirts. Really? I have shirts. I have shirts. If, if you go to the website... Oh, yeah, there's a couple of things. If you go to the Adventures of Puss and Dick website, 
they have all kinds of shirts and beautiful colors that you can order. They have um, tanks. I think they have um, hoodies. There's you can uh, get uh, phone covers with either um, all of the characters, or you can get one that's got Puss. You got one that's got Dick, and you've got one that's got uh, Venmar, the angel with um, Bible the bird. And on my website, if you go, a couple of things. If you go under events, you always know where you can find me uh, locally and hopefully conventions as well, please. Um, but also, I've got a store on there. And on the store, you can, I have, I've put together three um, montages of one is all South Park characters, one is all anime characters, and one is a lot of, well, all of them, like, in the 90s, I was doing the voice of Crackle, so I've got him on there. So those are available um, to buy with my autograph or with whatever message you want. But I also have my wire sculptures uh, and earrings, and they're one of a kind. There is no way I could duplicate any of those. So if they're interested in, you know, payment is easy and reasonable. So, yeah. Excellent. And you can find me on Twitter and Instagram at Josh L. Kane. You can find the podcast on Instagram at Animation Station Podcast, on Twitter at Animate Podcast, on Facebook and Tumblr, Animation Station Podcast. You can also find all of our episodes on iTunes, Stitcher, Podbean, and on our website, AnimationStationPodcast.com. Just click on the little podcast tab, and you can find all of our episodes. Again, Mona, thanks so much for coming on. This was really fun. Thank you. This is a pleasure. Anytime. All right, so for the an oh no problem. So for the Animation Station podcast, I'm Josh. I'm Mona. I'm Mona. Bye, everybody. And I'm Mona. I think <laughs> I am anyway. Okay, bye for now. <laughs>